Welcome to the Remarkable Riparian Digital Short Course, an online education series covering the basics of riparian understanding. This self-paced learning program is produced by the Nueces River Authority in Texas, but the concepts presented here are pretty much universal to all natural waterways. In Lesson 4, we'll learn more about how a river works. But first, let's make sure we have a common understanding of what riparian means. This is a term that has really only come into common usage in Texas in the past 10 to 15 years, even among land management professionals. A riparian area or zone is the part of the landscape that flanks rivers and streams, shown in blue on this picture. This includes the stream bank, floodplain, plants, soils, and rocks that make up the ribbon of land that flanks the waterway. Areas adjoining lakes and reservoirs are also considered riparian, but this short course will focus mainly on rivers and streams. In order to learn how a creek operates, it's important to consider all the parts. The primary part is the channel, which is confined by the banks. Water flowing within the channel most of the time is called base flow. This normal level of flow is sustained by water released from the banks and springs. Then we have the floodplain where flood waters reach on a regular basis. Flood flows are an essential component of the river system. The floodplain is made up of sediments, which can range in size from fine sand to large rocks. The invisible water table stored within the land is connected to the creek and is an important part of the riparian system. The water table connected to a creek or river is referred to as an alluvial aquifer. Vegetation plays a key role. In the riparian area, certain plants are adapted to grow quite well. We also have large wood, like fallen trees, and all the other organic debris which can include leaves, twigs, and pieces and parts of many things that were once alive. We need a common vocabulary to communicate about riparian areas and understand their condition. Let's look at a cross-section of a river showing different types of flow. Base flow is sustained by the water stored in the stream banks, which is released slowly over time. Springs and spring flow also contribute to base flow. Bank full flow is when the water reaches the top of the banks, as the name suggests. This is the type of flow that does most of the work moving sediments and forming channels. Flood flows go over the top of the banks and into the floodplains. Flood flows are essential as they contribute the most sediment to the banks and floodplains and water to the water table. Riparian areas are dynamic. Many different processes occur simultaneously, especially during flooding. Here we will introduce a few of the processes and build on our riparian vocabulary. Erosion and deposition are important balancing forces at work in a river. Bank full flow, as described in the previous slide, fills the channel. Sinuosity is the degree of crookedness or meander in the channel. Sinuosity is an important factor in flood energy dissipation. The width to depth ratio is a way of understanding if the channel is narrow enough to efficiently move sediments, or if it's wider than it should be, which is common in degraded riparian areas. The gradient is the slope or steepness of the channel. The gradient is influenced most by the channel's length and its sinuosity or meander pattern. Recruitment is the process of gaining new plants. Root density and channel stability and plant succession are other important concepts which will be discussed further in Lesson 6. While the riparian area is a very small percentage of the landscape, usually less than 1%, it contributes greatly to water quality and quantity. So why are all these processes and components so important? because there is a lot of power in a raindrop. And when all those raindrops get together in a channel, you can imagine the energy they possess. Many of the processes in a riparian area have to do with dissipating that energy. So how do rivers process energy? Vegetation plays a major role by creating resistance, slowing the water down. Another way that rivers process energy is by becoming longer. Here's how it works. The water flowing with a lot of energy starts to erode the first bank it reaches, creating a cut bank. The current then bounces off that bank and hits the opposite bank a little further down, creating a cut bank there too. 
At the same time, the eroded material gets deposited across from the cut banks, creating point bars. This process repeats itself as the river flows downstream, and that's how a river's snaking, meandering form is created. In this way, the channel becomes longer and less steep. You may remember the Walla Walla River from Lesson 1. It offers us a great visual example of the concept of crookedness as a river's natural flow path. A river and its riparian area work like a finely tuned machine where the soil, water, and vegetation all work together. If any of these components are damaged, the equilibrium will be disrupted. In Lesson 5, we'll learn more about that.